So I wanted to tell you a little bit about Patty, uh, but before I do that, before we go any further, my friend Jill Austin is going to say a prayer over us. Bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father and Mighty King, we come before you today and thank you for this opportunity to learn about healing prayer. We call upon you, Lord God, and we plead the blood of Jesus over Patty and Cindy and all of us here today as a protection against the enemy. We cancel all assignments of Satan over this time of teaching, and we ask you to send your heavenly army to camp around each one of us. Heavenly Father, open our eyes that we may see how great you are and how complete your provision is for us today. Blessed Holy Spirit, anoint Patty as she teaches us that we might experience the fullness of your will for us today. Come with power, Lord Jesus. We pray in the precious name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So again, if you can let us see you on the screen, that'll be great. We understand there might be reasons for you to turn that off and leave your your mic muted at all times. Well, thank you for that. Um, so Patty is a friend that I met several years ago at a, a Psalm training that I did, a day retreat. And then we were reconnected again for the healing journey. And Patty, like many of us that are interested in healing prayer, um, has had much of her own healing of brokenheartedness and the things of life. And that's really what draws us to the uh, belief that uh, Jesus heals because uh, he heals when he heals us. So that's been Patty's experience. She's been involved in women's ministry and teaching for almost 30 years. She and her husband were missionaries in Ecuador. And she's now with Wellspring Church where she is part of the team that developed the transformational prayer ministry um, that we are invited to participate in. You can go on to Wellspring's website and sign up for some transformational inner healing prayer. Uh, I have done that and I had a huge breakthrough. It was awesome. I highly recommend it. So Patty is, you know, was instrumental in getting that started and we're hoping to um, expand that throughout our diocese. She's uh, done much of her training with Elijah House Ministries, and we recommend that as a source to you to go online. They have um, videos and listening tracks, and it's a, it's a very useful resource, but she, as well as Jill, have kind of sat under the teaching in person of the Sanfords, which is always a good way to learn. So I'm really grateful for Patty and all of the time she's put in to uh, preparing this teaching for us today. So Patty, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And I thank each one of you for taking time on a Saturday to, um, to allow the Lord to do a work, uh, not only through you, but in you. Um, I know this season of COVID has been, the word is unprecedented, but um, I think it's very intentional of God that he has called us away from so much distraction and he's trying to call us to himself. And I think it is no coincidence that each one of you have been hand chosen today to be here. I think that in his timing, the fullness of his time, he knows that you are ready to take another step in your own personal healing. We all have areas of our heart that we've closed off. They're wounded, they're hidden, they're protected. And um, we're going to invite the Lord um, through his teaching from the words of my lips that are his words that he will reach each one of you individually in a very personal way. So um, I want to start with a series of scripture that is so very familiar to all of us. It's from Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me 
because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion and to bestow a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of sorrow or mourning. The, oh, I'm sorry, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And then those who have been called and have been received that good news are so transformed that they become the ones that will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And they will be the ones that rebuild the ancient ruins that have been and will restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. And if the Lord has ever made that personal to you as he has for me, because that was the calling on my life. Um, if he's made those verses personal to you, then you know that as he does that healing in you, um, you have been called to bring this to others. It doesn't have to be any official ministry at all. It is the call of every single believer to be healed, to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and to bring that message of healing to others. And, um, and we will see the amazing results of having uh, the areas in our lives and our families that have been devastated for generations to see the Lord rebuild them in a beautiful new way. So as we introduce this idea of healing, um, I think of the McNutts, Francis McNutt in his book, Healing. Patrick, you must have had a lot of training there. I want to see your responses. I can't hear you yet, but I'm all about reading your faces, okay? So um, Francis McNutt talked about four kinds of healing in his book, Healing. There is the physical healing, and um, it's a very real thing. It is for today. Uh, there is emotional healing, which includes the healing of emotions and memories. And then there is deliverance, which is not a scary thing because it's not about Satan. It's all about Jesus. And that's a whole different perspective than most of Christianity thinks of. So the third part would be deliverance, but the, the fourth part is spiritual, and that is forgiveness. Our spiritual healing comes through forgiveness. And unforgiveness is what blocks our healing. It is the number one thing that blocks us. So forgiveness opens the door, and then the love of Christ comes through and brings the healing. We are not the healers. We are like the friends of Jesus that bring the paralytic, our friend who is paralyzed in unforgiveness and bitterness, and we bring them to the feet of Jesus. It is gentle. It is not confrontational. It is without shame or condemnation, without judgment. We have received that kind of healing ourselves. So we want to bring that gently to other wounded people. So forgiveness is the single key that sets us free into that abundant life that Jesus has promised for every believer. So um, Cindy mentioned Elijah House. Several of you nodded. You've been exposed to their teachings before. Um, I think that they offer some of the most fundamental, um, not formulaic, but fundamental truths 
that are built on the whole gospel. It's built on forgiveness through the blood of Christ, and it is built on sanctification and transformation as we crucify the flesh and fleshly patterns. It's two parts. Today will be the forgiveness, and in two weeks, we'll talk about the sanctification and the tools that Elijah House has equipped, has found John Sanford and his wife Paula found very helpful in trying to identify those patterns. Patterns that have left us in bondage, patterns that have um, left us stuck and um, in, in sin and um, under oppression by the evil one. So, um, Sanford would say that um, it is the purpose is for God, purpose of all transformational ministry is for people to, to have their hearts reconciled to God the Father, to be reconciled again to the heart of the Father, and that we would also be reconciled not only vertically, but horizontally to one another. And in our woundedness, we not only separate ourselves from one another, but we obstruct our intimacy with God because a bitterness that we have, um, Hebrews 12, 15 says that um, if we miss the grace of God, a bitter root is formed in us and by it, we defile many and we defile people 360 degrees around us because that bitter root can always be triggered. That bitter root from some unforgiveness, some pain that is not being dealt with, some part of our heart that doesn't totally believe the whole gospel, that God is big enough for this wound. So um, we want the whole gospel and I want him to have my whole heart. And I think that you are ready for him to have your whole heart. And so we're going to gently move into that today. Um, when I, um, I want to look at a scripture that is so appropriate for this, and it's from 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. It says, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We therefore are Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We therefore, um, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, and I say also to one another. So this ministry of healing prayer, of transformational ministry, um, it requires that we listen um, and look through the eyes of our heart with the compassion of Jesus. We can't do this in our own strength at all. And it's not gonna be what we say, it's gonna be the Holy Spirit working through us. It has to be his words of life, his words of truth that penetrate through all the layers. Um, so, we can have the heart of Christ and it is our role to represent Jesus to them. Whether you're at your kitchen counter with a neighbor, whether you're with your spouse, your roommate, whether you're in an office doing prayer ministry, whether you're on Zoom as some of our prayer meetings have been lately, it is the compassion of Jesus that's going to flow through you to someone else. Um, so prayerfully, we invite the Holy Spirit. We seek his wisdom, his insight, his discernment. 
We ask for his revelation. Where do we go with this, Lord? We hear their story um, and we respond as he leads us. Um, Linda Hearn is part of this gallery and she and I have partnered many times. I've learned a lot from Linda about listening with the heart of Jesus and, um, and just flowing with the spirit and without an agenda, without a set of tools you're trying to use, but using those tools as the Lord leads you, as you trace patterns in a person's life, as you look at the fruit of their life, do you see they hold a grudge? Do they see a pattern that's being repeated in their life that they keep cycling through in the same thing and getting stuck over and over? It might be the um, interaction between an, an employer and them as an employee, but no matter what job they go to, the same thing seems to happen. So we see these patterns, that they have patterns maybe that are um, dysfunctional in their marriage or with their kids or with friends, but it may have started, those sense of anticipation of rejection may have started in their childhood. So this ministry um, also is a work that only God can do because only he can set the captives free and only he can bring light into our darkness. Um, so often when we come, we finally have the courage to come forward and be vulnerable. We're met with trite answers. We're given advice. They tell us about their story. Um, there's shame. There's blame. It might be even in our own relationship with the person we're closest to. Sometimes we're afraid to confess that we've done something wrong or own up. Well, who did this in the kitchen? And I said, not me. I didn't see it that way. You know, we deflect it because we're afraid of the consequences. And we're afraid of one another. We're afraid to be totally naked and unashamed. But I am encouraging you to be the safe ones who have found healing yourself and that you will be a safe person for others. And that we as the family of God will become a safe community. Church is not necessarily a safe place. So many people feel judged and they never come back. We can think of whole populations of our whole areas, uh, sectors of our population who don't feel comfortable in our churches because they think they'll be judged, looked down on. Even if you have a homeless ministry, they don't feel comfortable because they're not dressed like everybody else. They expect judgment. So it grieves me, but even more, it grieves the heart of God. So we want to work through our own woundedness. We want to be free to love and let God's love pour through us so that people will be safe with us. And I believe you're here because you want that for yourself and you want to bring it to others. Um, so it's very important that we deal with our own mess and we are all messy, as my dear friend Linda would remind me. I was, when I went to Elijah House in 2009, the first time I was in a small group and Mark Sanford, John Sanford's son led my small group. Here we are in one of the dorm rooms. There's Mark and we have little chairs around. There's four of us and um, I'm shifting the blame. And Mark looks at me in his gentle way and he says, Patty, you're not very comfortable with the idea that you're a sinner who needs a savior. And it just, it was so true, but it was so piercing. And um, my husband will sometimes remind me that in my earlier years, Patty, you're not very comfortable with being that you are a sinner in need of a savior. You're not the, the sinless one here. So it's, it's not being afraid to own 
our frailties and our sinfulness. Um, a dear friend has told me um, she is grateful that her sin is exposed because it's an opportunity for grace. And I think that's, that can break so many barriers for us. Um, so it is my deep prayer that you, as you go through your own healing and transformation, you will become a wounded healer for others. Well, the first main point I want to, uh, first part of our outline, which you will have in your hands, but I didn't want you to read it while we're doing this, um, is the grace of repentance. And um, you all are in mature believers, or you wouldn't be here. Uh, so you know that repentance is, is a ch changing of our mind. It is a turning, it is a turning 180 degrees away from our self-determined path, and we're turning towards God. We're returning to God. And um, it is nothing we can do on our own strength. It is totally motivated by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts us. It is the Holy Spirit that woos us. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us the grace um, and mercy to come forward, that we can come forward without judgment. So repentance takes place in the heart and not in your mind. Um, we often tell our children, okay, go ask your brother to forgive you. And they say, will you forgive me? And she says, yes. And we've all done it. But do we just go to Jesus and say, will you forgive me kind of flippantly? Or has the Lord broken our heart? And it is his kindness, not his judgment, that leads us to repentance. It is an act of love. And that verse is from Romans 2, 4. Do not show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead us to repentance. And it's his desire that you would have a greater experience of him, not just a head knowledge. It's like the Spanish word for head knowledge is saber, but the heart knowledge is conocer, to know someone so intimately. And that's what he wants. That was Paul's prayer, and it's his prayer for us, that we might know Christ above all else in that intimate way. Well, another point in this is that all sin is against the heart of God. It is not necessarily just offending a person. And that person has not only offended us, that person has broken the heart of God. In Psalm 51, David said, Lord, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. That's the bottom line. I think we forget that. And it gives us, when we forget it, it gives us permission to stay angry to hold our bitterness against somebody. But if we pause and we think, Lord, against you, I have grieved the Holy Spirit. That changes everything. Because the last person in, the life, in my world I wanna offend is the Lord who loves me so much. So in his love, it is his unfailing love that draws us, his unfailing love, and he draws us with loving kindness, as Jeremiah 31, three says. That changes everything. So the conviction by the Holy Spirit is a gift. 
It's a gift. It is grace. Yes. It is grace. And I love what Father Richard Rohr of the Center of Action and Contemplation says. He says, grace is God giving himself to us. Here's this offer that you can be filled with the fullness of God. Why would we want to take anything less? His heart is for oneness with us. He already looks on us with favor. He has called us by name and chosen. We are his. We can come out unafraid to own up to it so that nothing interferes with us in our relationship with him. If you've been married for a long time, and I see some faces that have more years than I have, and I have 43 and a half. So if you have a marriage that you have worked hard and you have come to a level of intimacy that is so sweet, sometimes it's so sublime that you know that if there are grains of bitterness, grains, sand grains of bitterness between you, you feel it. And I want you to be so sensitive to the Holy Spirit that if you feel grains of sin between you, you are moved to a brokenness and a humble and contrite heart. So they won't stay that way. In 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10, I didn't put it on the sheet, so I have to look it up right here. It says, this was Paul's admonition. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not, you might not suffer loss in anything, especially your intimacy with God. And that you might not suffer loss through anything that we do to one another. For sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. This leads to salvation, but a sorrow of the world produces death. Now I bet every one of you know someone who had such regret about their life you know at least one person that it led to suicide. I know a couple of people. And the evil one had so convinced them that it was an unforgivable sin. They got caught or the situation, their debt being discovered, how they've cheated their company out of millions of dollars, hundreds of dollars, whatever it was you know it led them to death. And that was a scheme of the evil one. He is a thief who steal, kills, and destroys. And we cannot underestimate him. He can lead us to death spiritually, emotionally, and physically. He's out to kill anyone who reflects the image of Christ because that will attack the heart of God. So we have to know his schemes and we want the sorrow of the conviction of sin to lead us towards the Lord, not away in shame. Go girl, the Holy Spirit's here. I don't even need my notes most of the time. This is good. <laughs> um, okay, let's move on to Our resistance to reconciling with God and others. Um, oh my gosh, it's 10 o'clock. It didn't take this long when I was doing it by myself over and over. Can we keep going? 
Do you need a break? Cindy? We'd agreed you'd teach for an hour. You've got 30 minutes. Okay. I panicked. I saw 10. Yeah, and we did. started at nine. Okay. Um, our resistance to reconciling with God and others. So because of our individual wounding, especially wounding that happened in childhood, um, from our parents, from the significant adults, um, Satan uses that as a way to plant lies from the time we're a child. And from there, we, we build defenses. We make inner vows. We make judgments and we have expectations that people are going to do certain things to us. We'll go into that in more detail next lesson. But there, um, we even doubt the character of God sometimes because of the wounds we've had. And we expect God to behave like people in our lives have treated us. We expect they might not, he might not be available. He may not be present. Um, he may be judgmental like a father figure. Um, all sorts of things that we can project onto God that are untrue. I thought that um, Ruth Haley Barton described very well why some of us get stuck. She wrote this in her book, Sacred Rhythms. I wouldn't usually read this much to you, but I think that this is very valuable. Some of us have been so shaped by shame-based family or church systems that we resist entering into the deeper levels of self-knowledge for fear of feeling debilitated by shame or swept away by remorse. For others, our sense of worth is so fragile or perfectionism so pronounced that we are not sure we could bear the truth of our own darkness without becoming completely unraveled. And yet one of the deepest longings of the human heart is to be known and loved unconditionally. We long to be seen and celebrated for that which is deeply good and worthwhile in us and we long for a love that is strong enough to contain our frailties and our sinfulness. Something in us knows that such a love is a transforming power. But even knowing this, we vacillate be between our tendency of the human heart to be known and loved unconditionally. And we long at the same time to be seen and celebrate for that which is deeply good and worthwhile in us and we long for a love that is strong enough to continue. I'm sorry. And yet one of the deepest longings of the human heart is to be known and loved unconditionally. We long to be seen and celebrated for that which is deeply good and worthwhile in us. And we long for a love that is strong enough to contain our frailty and sinfulness. Something in us knows that such a love is a transforming power. But even knowing this, we vacillate between our tendency to hide that which is truest about us and our longing to be changed by love. We are drawn to the possibility of deeper freedom and spiritual transformation, yet we would like to avoid the full weight of what that might require of us. So it's a push me, pull me. We're in this tug of war. And uh, Satan is pulling one way and the Lord is gently, gently alluring us toward him from the other direction. The next part would be that there is a mandate to forgiveness. There's a mandate to forgive. Jesus said it multiple times in multiple ways. The, our father is one uh, example. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, but deliver us from evil. I love that that is connected because the unforgiveness is opening the way to 
oppression from the enemy. Um, Jesus also said, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive their sins, your heavenly father will not forgive your sins. Now, I want to unpack that a little bit because it's conditional. Yet, we know that all of us sin. It can't mean that I make one sin and that's all it takes. But I want you to look at it as um, the intention of our heart. Are we unwilling to allow the Lord in those areas? Are we unwilling to, I mean, determined not to forgive someone? Um, you know, the Holy Spirit speaks to each one of our hearts and only you know if that applies to you, if there's an area where um, the Lord might be blocking prayer, answering prayer because of sin that is undealt with. Um, so Paul encourages us in Ephesians 4 verses 31 and 32 to get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, all brawling and slander along with every form of malice, and that he urges us to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, that in Christ God has forgiven you and me. In this past year, I, in my family, all used the book, The Daily Devotional by Paul David Tripp called New Morning Mercies. It is so fresh and it is a full breakfast of the gospel every morning. I never learned so much about grace in my life from different facets. And Tripp calls us grace amnesiacs. Grace amnesiacs, because we forget the grace that God has shown us. We forget that we were children deserving the wrath of God. Children of wrath. We forget that we are now sons and daughters of God. We forget that we were and in the futility of our minds, we were held captive by Satan to do his will. But now he has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And we are children of light. I don't want to forget that. I want to remember who I am in Christ. I want to rehearse who I am in Christ. And if I live from that place and my position in Christ I will love like he loves. I will be moved by the things that move him. I will weep over the things that make him weep. You know, I think when Jesus wept with Mary and Martha, he was weeping that it didn't have to be this way. We didn't have to have these consequences. We didn't have to be separated from him. We didn't have to have all this suffering. Forgiveness moves us through to restore our peace and the abundant life. So I, I just ask you to hold on to that phrase, grace amnesiacs, um, and that um, you'll be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit when he tells you that you've forgotten. Um, and as we turn to one another, we didn't deserve the grace and mercy he showed us. And they don't deserve it either. It's easier for us to remember that they don't deserve it because of what they've done to us. This offense is so great, but I forget that my offenses are enormous. Only God, only God knows who I was before he found me. He knows the rebellious little, I don't even know what words to describe. <laughs> he knows what I was and he pursued me and loved me while I was in my sin.
The next part I want to talk about is the bondage of unforgiveness. In Ephesians 4, this is a key verse. Um, it is from Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. And there is this warning from Paul. In your anger, okay, so you're angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Don't stay that way. Don't stay stuck. Don't hold on to it. Don't fuel the flame of anger. It takes a lot of energy and adrenaline to fuel an anger. And after a while, we might actually enjoy that invigoration of fueling the anger and the unforgiveness. It could be addictive. But he warns us because it says, do not give the devil a foothold. Think of your front door and you've got a pushy salesman at the door and you say, no, I'm not interested. But they stick their foot in the door and you can't slam the door. This is what's happening. You're giving him access. You're giving him ground. And Satan, when we have unforgiveness in our heart, this is a legal issue. He has a right to access to you. Now, this is not demon possession. This is oppression. There are other ways to give ground to Satan. But today, I want you to think about the opportunities that God has had in your life by unforgiveness. And your wound was real. The offense was real. I'm not saying that someone did not hurt you deeply. It may have been a parent who did not love you as your heart needed to be loved. It may have been something that someone did to you or to your loved one. They may have been emotionally abused, physically abused, sexually abused. It may have been betrayal. Satan can use all of those things and our heart says, this is too big to forgive. That's a lie. There is nothing that someone can do to us that is unforgivable. I mean, infidelity in a marriage. I mean, a parent who physically, sexually abuses a child, an innocent child, horrendous, heinous. It is not too great. to watch someone kill your child in front of you. Unspeakable. And yet we see mothers, fathers, forgive the people who shot their child, who macheted their son or daughter or husband. It's possible, but only by the grace of God. And these people who are an example to us did not let Satan win. They let the love of God, which is greater than all our sin, conquer the hate because love is stronger than hate. Love is always stronger than hate. I think of the story of Joseph Tong, who was a, past, a pastor in Romania who was persecuted under the dictator Ceausescu, imprisoned, beaten, and he could stand up to them because he was unafraid of death. And he said to uh, the author of one of the books that I'll be sharing with you, he said, release them. 
Because as long as you don't forgive, you are chained to them. Um, in a minute, I'll have the exact quote. You are chained to them as long as you hold on to that bitterness. So it's an important fact that this is a major scheme of Satan. And if we're aware of his schemes, we won't fall for them. Um, and then we look at Ephesians 6 about putting on the armor. It says, um, we know that Satan's scheme is to deceive. And so we have to be vigilant to keep the enemy from having an opportunity or an advantage. Because his arrows, you know, like Native Americans, they made arrows. It took a lot of labor. You don't waste an arrow. So he knows your weak spots. He knows where you've been wounded before. He knows how to get under your skin. We want to be aware of his, skin, his schemes. Um, and all of us are susceptible to lie that we can have intimate fellowship with God and still harbor bitterness towards somebody. But that's a lie. Um, 1 John 1, 6 says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do, do not live out the truth. So Satan also attacks our true identity. He attacks uh, who we are in Christ, our position in Christ. This is his strategy. And where we've sinned before, he'll come around, try to use the same thing. He is not creative. He will use a lot of the same old schemes. But God's intention is always that we would be unhindered from revealing Jesus in all his love to others. And we will conquer with love and forgiveness. Okay, we're moving on to the freedom of forgiveness. I have good news. I have great news. We can submit our hearts to God. We can humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We can receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit humbly with a broken and contrite heart. And he will move us through into repentance. His kindness keeps luring us lovingly, gently, luring us back to his heart. And we can reclaim all the ground that we've given to Satan. There will be consequences of our sins, yes, but there will not be punishment. The punishment, Jesus took our punishment, all of our punishment. You know, we might fear the punishment of our parents that they did not love like God loves, but God is not like that. He will not continue to punish us. He will discipline us with love. He will allow us to have the consequences of our actions, but he will not shame us. He will not condemn us. And we don't have to live under that. And we don't have to live under our own self-condemnation, which is huge. I know that God has forgiven me, but I have a terrible time forgiving myself. A scheme of Satan to keep us captive. We are no different than the people in Isaiah 61. We are being held captive by the lies of Satan. We are being held captive. We have given him ground because we have fallen for his schemes. But he came to set the captives free. And that's you and me. And we will bring it to other people. And it's an amazing privilege to look someone in the eye across your kitchen counter, face to face, whether on Zoom or in an office, to be the one, to be the gentle reminder of God's love, to bring someone back into fellowship. 
It's the most beautiful thing. Once the Lord has used you, you will know that there's nothing more important you could be doing with your life. It may be in the office. It may be in medicine. It doesn't have to be as a, as a minister. It's everyone is called to this. So we want to enjoy that freedom of forgiveness. And what I was telling you before, this is the exact quote by Joseph Tong. It's J-O-S-I-F. T-S-O-N. If you look him up on YouTube, his stories are astounding. How the Lord prepared him to be like a lamb before the wolves as he went back to his home country knowing he would be persecuted, imprisoned, and probably brought to, put to death. If he can forgive, what an example. So this, now you know a little of his background. Now hear the quote. You must forgive them. Until you totally forgive them, you will be in chains. Release them and you will be released. That is part of what the author R.T. Kendall builds his book, Total Forgiveness. And that will be one of the resources I give you because that is one of the best books I found on total forgiveness. And it also has a study guide, which is very practical and personal. So um, one of the quotes by R.T. Kendall, friend of Joseph Song, is um, relinquishing bitterness is an open invitation to the Holy Spirit to give you back his peace, his joy, and the knowledge of his will. It's the key to regaining the fruit of the spirit because the flow of the spirit won't be quenched. And I'm going to dare to take you one more step. And this is hard because Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of the Father in heaven, that you would look just like your dad. That is hard. If you always felt abandoned like an orphan in your own family, If you felt used or abused, if you were used or abused, if you were cheated or betrayed, he's still asking you to forgive them and to go the next step and to pray for them and pray blessing over them. There might be a selfish reason for doing it because the gates of blessing will open for you and you will be blessed. So even if you do it just for yourself, not only release them to God, forgiveness is releasing them to God. It's releasing your past. It's releasing your offenses. It's trusting God with the outcome. So I'm going to close by talking about what total forgiveness is. Not just forgiveness, but total forgiveness. And this material is um, both from Neil Anderson, who was the first person who ever taught me about who I am in Christ. Victory over the darkness, bondage breaker, and steps to freedom. They may have been written in the mm, 80s and early 90s, but it is so relevant. Um, 
I have brought copies of that book overseas. I've given it to people in Spanish. It is fundamental. Um, Neil Anderson would just put this in very succinct nuggets. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not tolerating sin. It does not demand revenge or repayment of any kind for the offenses suffered. That's hard. That's against our human nature. Forgiveness means resolving to live with the consequences of another person's actions and their sins. But until you forgive the person, he or she will continue to hurt you because you have not relieved, released yourself from the past. Those are truths from Neil Anderson. Joseph Tong also had a lot of really good points in his book. And I will give you a list of them. I will just go through them without explaining them today. What total forgiveness is not. It is not approval of what they did. It's not excusing what they did. It's not justifying what they did. And it's not pardoning what they did. Jesus pardons them. We release them. Our job is to release them to God. We want to be the judge, but he can't be the judge if we're the judge. It's a really important concept. When we release to God, he can be the judge and he can dull out whatever punishment that person needs. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And um, even David asked for God's mercy instead of the mercy of men, because men are not merciful. So we will, um, it's not reconciliation necessarily. It's not denying what they did. It's not blindness to what happened. And it's not forgetting. We will not forget but it won't be the first thing in the front of our mind. It's not refusing uh, to take the wrong seriously and it's not pretending that we're not hurt. And what total forgiveness is, is being aware of what someone has done and still choosing to forgive them. It is choosing to keep no record of wrongs. It is refusing to punish giving up our natural desire to see them get what's coming to them. It's not gossiping about the fender, trying to get people on to see things from our perspective. It's, it, is, um, it is being merciful. It is being gracious. And that can be shown uh, as much by what we don't say as by what we do say, even if it's true. Um, it's an inner condition. It's the absence of bitterness. It's relinquishing bitterness. Uh, relinquishing bitterness is an open invitation for the Holy Spirit to give you his peace, his joy, and the knowledge of his will, like I mentioned before. And it's two other very important things in these last two minutes. Forgiveness may mean forgiving God. because he didn't answer our prayers in the way we asked. Forgiveness is something we have to work through in our relationship with God. When we've prayed for a loved one who was suffering and the chronic pain continues, it's praying for someone with cancer and they die. When we're disappointed with God, Sometimes, as much as we hate to admit it, we've made a judgment against God and we have to confess and work through our own seeking forgiveness for our judgments against him. And then 
it's the last thing I would mention is that we have to forgive ourselves. Forgive ourselves for the decisions we made in our youth when we were romantically involved and uh, we gave ourselves away, when we weren't our own to give away. We've been bought with a price and we didn't cherish our temple. It's when we've had an abortion and we've kept it a secret our whole life and we can never forgive ourselves. There's so many secret sins. It's infidelity. It's the consequence of divorce. It's so many things that are so painful and we don't want to admit. So by God's grace, we want to forgive ourselves. So after a short break, about 10 minutes, uh, we'll come back and um, we'll take questions and we'll see if I can answer them. But then um, we're going to move into some personal prayer. So it was a ton of material. I hope that it flowed in a way that it was the Holy Spirit bringing it to you and not me, and that um, you will have this in your hands very soon. Cindy has it. It's just going to take a forward and it'll go right to you. So um, I just didn't want you distracted by it while I was speaking. So thank you. Um, on one of the resource sheets, all my bibliography is there and it will um, also have my email for whatever reason. Okay, thank okay, you. I'm going to we'll take slide about back up to Patrick's question. How can we pray with a compassionate, forgiving heart in the presence of a spirit of the age filled with greed, corruption, lust for power, oppression, exploitation of tragedy? Oh, wow, what a appropriate question and it's overwhelming. I was thinking how much we are offended daily by this bombardment and how we are layering trauma upon trauma upon trauma with all the negativity and toxic waste that is that we're exposed to. Um, I guess one of the things we can do is limit our intake of the news. Um, set our mind on things above. Be immersed in the word and limit our social media. And um, as you receive messages, Go to the Holy Spirit. Don't take everything as gospel truth that is being fed to you, that we have to filter it. We have the mind of Christ and um, he can give us discernment. I am brokenhearted by some of the things that I hear that evangelicals believe. I am just uh, brokenhearted, whether it's for health reasons, COVID, um, political, the whole gamut. Um, people who know the Lord are being deceived. So we, we have the mind of Christ and he gives us the truth. The Holy Spirit's our counselor. And how do we pray? Um, I was talking about this with my husband. Um, if you want to pray with the compassion of Jesus, get ready to cry. Get ready to have your heart broken. Even my 90 year old mother-in-law has never had a time like this. And um, I know we say it's unprecedented, but it is not out of the sovereign realm of God's will, all that's happening. 
So I ask you to shift from looking at this from the eyes of man to looking at this through the perspective and the grid of the gospel, that this is all about the kingdom. This is a global attempt for God to reach the whole world at the same time and get our attention. That we are not overwhelmed by it, but that we are involved in the spiritual warfare that is taking place. Um, I know that there are some good comments that could be added to that. What do you want to do, Cindy? Um, I, I guess if you um, want to add to that just now for this comment, give a wave and turn on your mic and respond. I think it's a spiritual situation. Everything is a spiritual situation. You can't separate it. So um, God in his great love chose us to be living at this time for such a time as this. And so, as weak as we think we are and as overwhelmed as we feel and as isolated as we feel, he has chosen us to stand firm in the Lord in the strength of his might mm -hmm. and that he has given us everything we need for godliness. And we are not citizens of this world. And we have to remember these things and pray intentionally into it. Patty? That's um, what my husband and I are doing. Casey, did you have something you wanted to add? You need to unmute. Um, no, not directly on that. I, I think. Uh, my general response was that so much of our fear and unforgiveness is driven by a need for control and feel feeling of a lack of control. And so I was going to pass back to Patty and, and also my prayer that I can give up the need to control and uh, will that to the Holy Spirit and live in that grace rather than living in the fear of a need to control. Wow, thank you, Casey. Thank you. I'm gonna write that down for myself. Patty, I had an opportunity. I got an email from someone and I never pass on anything without I don't like to anyway, but I got this and there were like 35 people on it. And I couldn't believe I had such an internal uh, disruption. I mean, it was a spiritual feeling inside. If I prayed for almost two weeks to have insight to be able to respond because I could not be quiet. But the Lord led me with scripture, with turning people's hearts back to him and how we had to stand and look at things through the lens of scripture and not by worldly view. So we also have to ask the Lord to help us find our voice and to be compassionate, but to draw people to Christ and to help allay their fears with what all is going on in the world. Thank you. I'm going to ask everybody to mute again. Um, and we have something here from... Uh, he, Huck, an old friend recently confessed to me an addiction to pornography. He's a new believer. Any suggestions on how to minister to him? Yes, Huck. Um, oh, I, I wish you'd turn on your big screen, even if you have to stand in front of it, mm -hmm. so I could see you face to face. But um, I, would, I would ask him more of his story. Thank you, Huck. Um, because he has a very legitimate need to feel loved. And the pornography is only a symptom of that. He's looking for love in a way that will never satisfy. It's not just a sexual sin. This is a, 
um, a longing of something that's legitimate in his heart to be filled. And um, I would listen to his story. It probably goes back to his childhood that he learned a pattern of substituting something else for something he wasn't receiving. Maybe he didn't get the love of a parent. And um, maybe, maybe he was sexually abused. Often those who um, are into pornography were exposed at a very young age. And often people who sexually abuse people were abused at a young age. So I would, I would invite him that you are a safe person to hear his story because there's so much more to it than what's at the tip of the iceberg. And um, Huck, from sitting with you even once over lunch, I consider you a very safe person because you're vulnerable that, you know, we all have sinned. And if you are vulnerable with him and how the power of God has helped you overcome sin, how the Holy Spirit will help you reveal the story and the root of when these things started. And now they're expressed as an adult in pornography, but it didn't start here. Thanks, Patty. The other question uh, that's in the chat is if we have chosen, this is from Lisa Elmers, if we have chosen to forgive someone or ourselves or God and have committed to release them, but still don't feel at peace, what should we do? What is the process of getting your heart fully to be at peace? It may take time. It, um, and I don't think that we can rely on our feelings to determine what God has accomplished. Our feelings are not trustworthy. Um, I want to have that confirmation of his peace, but um, it may be very gradual. Um, and and uh, Patrick adds to that, I think, to Lisa's question that he has found some comfort in praying the Psalms as David cries out to the Lord. And as most of you know, I would highly recommend the Psalms as a place to go to, to just meditate and go deeply into the peace of God and his righteousness. Darla said, amen. Yes. And, and Patrick, I really appreciate that you used praying the Psalms because when you personalize the word of God, it is the prayer of your heart. You're just borrowing. Maybe, maybe you don't have words for your own emotion. You can always pray scripture and it is powerful. And um, it's so pleasing to God because it's all his will. And um, there, there is great comfort in that. And to know that you're not the only one who feels this way. David felt that way and, and it's all common to man. And having um, someone come alongside to pray with you is incredibly powerful in the healing process. Um, healing takes place in authentic community. That's where the love is expressed. Um, I remember listening to a lot of teachings by Jim Wilder, who's a psych psychologist and um, did a lot of study on the brain and talked about, um, they find that healing takes much better when you're with someone who knows you, who loves you, who accepts you. Mm -hmm. So praying with someone, I mean, we used, I grew up Catholic. Um, did I find it helpful to come to the priest and confess? I didn't know what it was really about. But now I can confess my sins to a friend. I do it often. It's very freeing and it's comforting. So I um, want to remind you, if you have a question or a comment, you can type it into the chat and we will we'll manage it, that, continue to manage it that way. Sorry, Patty. Um, 
praying the scripture and praying with someone are both very um, comforting ways. Uh, let's see. We know an older believer who still retains a great fear of death. Any ideas on how to help? I'm thinking of a quote by Thomas Chalmers. It's, I can, may not give it directly, but um, he uses the phrase about the expulsive power of a new affection. And by that, I mean, the greater we can reveal the love of God, the less the fear will be because it's not only a verse that perfect love casts out fear, but God is perfect love. It's not just a characteristic of him, it's, it's his being, it's who he is. So the one who is perfect love casts out fear. And the more you can give an accurate representation and description of who God is, as love and safe with a future and a hope for him, uh, the more the fear will lessen. It will be the expulsion of the fear and the feeling of a new affection for the love of God. And uh, Lisa has just shared this website, fightthenewdrug.org has good resources for porn addiction. Um, though she doesn't have experience ministering in that situation, she's found it to be a good website for educating her children about pornography. It's always good to have some good resources. Thank you, Lisa. I'll see who, where Lisa is. Yeah. Oh, she's right down here with glasses on. On my screen, she's right next to Lane. Okay, there she is. thank you. Um, another yes. resource I will. You. Another resource I will unabashedly, because we're talking about praying the scripture, is to remind you, praying through Psalms, the book I wrote to uh, pray through the Psalms using Anglican prayer beads is a helpful resource in that got in that way. Also, it is soon to be released in Spanish. So pretty excited about that. Any more comments, questions? We put them into the chat. Patty, this has been very helpful. I know you've gotten thrown a couple of curveballs. <laughs> Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Um, and the answer is always Jesus, 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 isn't it? How can we get ourselves to refocus? And I would say one of the things around surrounding all of the angst that we have, um, even in the forgiveness, the lack of forgiveness, wherever it is, what, what's your place where you've found peace with the Lord in the past? You know, go back there, spend some time. I, I have some different habits that I have that, you know, I like to go up to my room and close the door and tell my husband to leave me alone and spend some time in Lectio or Emmanuel journaling. You all, there's a lot of you on from Advent and from our morning prayer, you know that I'm a huge fan of Lectio 365, a free app. And it just is a sweet place to go. And for 10 minutes, somebody else does all the work and all I do is press into the presence of the Lord. So if you have a, a practice that helps you do that, what, what is it? Where is that place that you can, you know, you get up in the morning and all the angst is already started up and you've done the coffee and you're thinking, well, I'm gonna get to prayer time. I'm gonna get, to, we'll get to prayer time. Get to that space, be alone with the Lord. And maybe all you need to do is take your coffee, take a deep breath and just say, here I am, Lord, and, and nothing else. You don't have to perform. Just go be in the presence of the Lord. 
who's waiting, who loves you, um, who has resources for you, and he'll reveal them. Well, I think we're ready to transition to another phase if we're finished with questions. So we have a half hour left. I'd like this to be a very intimate prayer time. I'm going to ask you all to go to your upper right hand corner and we're going to turn off the chat for right now uh, down on the bottom, but we're also going to go to the view and I'm going to have if this works, I'm going to switch to all gallery, but I want you to switch to just the speaker. Let's try that. Is that working for you? I think the very best you can get is that you are large on the screen and there'll be a strip of people above, but it won't be everybody. Okay. If somebody, Jeff, do you know a trick to get just the speaker for all of us to look at? I think there's a presentation mode or something, but I don't use Zoom very often, so I don't know where to look for it. You can click full screen. You can click full screen under the view and then minimize um, the view of everybody else. I have a, Everybody a place to click on speaker view up in the upper right hand corner. Yep. Yeah. And hit full screen. All Thank right. you, everyone. Now, if everybody will remute, that'll be great. Well, what I want to do is create a little cozy atmosphere <clears throat> where it's just you and me. Um, I am someone that you've gotten to know, someone that you trust. And um, I want a journey with you. I, um, it's like we're sitting across from each other with a cup of coffee or tea. And, um, and we have poured out our hearts to each other like friends, deep friends. And um, I think the Lord has brought you not just a lot of information this morning. I think the presence of the Lord has been here and he has been revealing things in your own heart. I want you to take some, some time right now and to just listen for the Holy Spirit. What has he been stirring up in you? What's an area of your heart that is kind of walled off? And why is that area walled off? And who was involved? In some hurt or wound that caused you to build up some defenses. Feel free to write yourself notes. Holy Spirit, thank you. Lord, you have, you have been moving in a very tangible way here this morning. 
and you have spoken to us very personally. You have reminded us, Lord, of someone who has hurt us deeply. And maybe we thought we've already dealt with it. Maybe we have, but maybe we still get triggered. Maybe something is going on in our present relationships that looks very similar to what we've experienced in the past. And we feel that same unsettledness and we feel those same emotions creeping up. Maybe it looks like a grudge that we hold. Maybe it looks like um, a sarcastic remark that we have when we talk about that person. Maybe it brings back just a flood of feelings of trauma. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. We invite you, Lord, to show us where you are in this feeling of pain or this feeling of resentment. Lord, you speak truth in our innermost being. And Lord, you can show us the hidden places. We trust you, Lord, right now you are doing that. Lord, we ask that if there is someone or if it's ourself, or if it's you that we can't forgive completely, you would show that to us. I thank you, Lord, that you're gentle You are kind. You have been patient with us. You are slow to anger. You are our father. And you are so other than our own father, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you never have forsaken us. You never have abandoned us or left us on our own. You have never harshly disciplined us. Or we're sorry that we have judged you as being unloving unkind, unfair. We're sorry, Lord, that we have judged you as being like someone in our, in our acquaintance. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you draw us with loving kindness, even right now. Lord, we take that step towards you. And 
and your arms are open wide. We want to know your unfailing love, your unconditional love. We have longed for this kind of love that satisfies. We want your love for us to be the love that ex expels every other kind of lesser love. And that it would expel any unforgiveness that we harbor in our hearts. Oh no, my battery is low. Lord God, you are calling us each by name into a new level of intimacy with you. So Lord, we ask that you would show us anything that hinders us, anything that has entangled us, that has to do with unforgiveness. We trust you, Lord. We name that person right now that has offended us deeply, Lord. And today, this 30th of January, we want it to be a milestone in Ebenezer that this is the day we are bringing them to you, Lord. And we are releasing them to you. That mother who, or father who is not fully present and couldn't give us what we needed because they didn't have it for themselves, Lord. We lift the friend who lied about us, who broke our trust, who betrayed us. We bring them to you, Lord. We release them to you. We lift a person that we were in love with who broke their vow, who broke our trust. Lord, there are dozens of different scenarios, but you know exactly what is going on in each heart on the screen. Father, uh, we know that there are those among us who were physically and sexually abused. We know that there have been spiritual guides set over us that have betrayed us. Lord, um, besides mother and father, brother and sister, there have been employers who have abused us and broken our trust. Father, even now, for many of us, we feel like our government leaders have broken our trust. Lord, all of those things we lay at your feet and we invite your Holy Spirit to come, to fill us, to heal us, to draw us closer to you. Father, that we truly do look to you. We look to you to restore us, to heal us, to guide us, and not a politician, not um, any, anyone that we have set on some sort of idol to be worthy of our followership, Lord, that in these times that we would be faithful to follow you, Lord, just you, and to remember that you have forgiven us you have so fully poured out forgiveness on us. And you love us. You love us in our messiness. You love us in our brokenness. 
what you see is the righteousness of your son, Jesus, that Jesus gives to us, that we're covered in it. And that is what you see. You see us the fully restored human being that will live forever with you. I think our friend Patty completely lost her battery. Um, oh, there she is. So Father, we thank you that you know those places where we struggle with forgiveness. Lord, I lift up especially the places that we think we've done the work that we have walked through healing places of forgiving someone and find ourselves again struggling with it. Lord, we do. I just, I pray with Patty's, um, the, the vision she gave us, the look to the Ebenezer that, Father, this would be the moment. This would be our, our transfiguration, our transformation this day that we are finally able to truly entrust all of our own brokenness mm -hmm. and all of the wrongs that have been done to us by another person that, Father, we put that all into your hand and you fill our heart with love for them. It may not be our own love, Father. We ask now that you fill our hearts with your love for those we know that have hurt us. Patty? Father, I thank you that you didn't need me. Your spirit is doing the work. Mm -hmm. I just thank you for what you're doing in every heart. May the movement of your heart, of your spirit, Lord, not be interrupted because of technology, Lord, but may you complete that which you are starting today. Lord, I am praying for a release and brand new freedom. I'm praying, Lord, that each person steps into a whole new level of intimacy with you and that they will know a joy and peace and a fullness of your presence beyond what they've had before. And Lord, because you are the faithful one, I know, Lord, that you offer this to us every time we sin against you. Every time we hold on to unforgiveness and that every individual will be able to do this now in the future and they will be able to bring it to one another. So I pray blessing over those who have injured us, who have offended us and wounded us deeply. We ask your very best for them, Lord. We ask that you might do a healing work in their hearts of every offender. And we ask, Lord, that they might know you and the power of your resurrection. They might be conformed to your image. They might have a new heart. The old heart of stone that offended others, Lord, would be removed and they would have a heart of flesh. And your spirit would move freely in them. And now, Lord, I pray blessing over everyone who has heard this message. I can picture each face, each name. And Lord, may I just pray your blessing over them. I thank you, Lord, that when we confess our sins to you, when we humble ourselves before you, Lord, you are the faithful one to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I pray that cleansing over each person that they might know that they are forgiven. 
and that you bless them, Lord, with a fresh impartation of your spirit. That they would go forth filled with the fullness of life. Lord, you have redeemed our lives from the pit. And you do it over and over through the blood of Christ and the gift of grace, of repentance and forgiveness. And so, Lord, may they go forward with fresh joy. And may they bring this amazing gift of forgiveness to others. I pray this in the amazing, powerful name of Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All glory and honor to you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Patty.